All right. Welcome to week three. We're making some progress. Um, this week we're going to dive into normalization. It's one of those interesting database topics that either you spend three weeks doing or you spend an hour and a half doing. Um, considering how compressed this course is, it, you're going to do the hour and a half version. Um, usually if you have, you know, a dedicated database design course that's semester long, then you'll get multiple weeks of normalization. Whereas you're getting four weeks of design. There's only so much time to do normalization in that. Um, so I'll do my best to get the concepts across. And we'll see how it goes. Okay. So data normalization. Normalization is a tool or technique, or a set of techniques, I should say, that validates and improve the logical design of a database to avoid duplication of data. Duplicated data is the enemy of a good database. Duplicated data has takes up room. It can throw you know a wrench in developing proper statistics. So data normalization is the pro is a process that where you decompose relations that have anomalies to produce smaller, well-structured uh, relations. In other words, we take a really complicated table of data and we break it down into its smallest component pieces to avoid anomalies. And usually when you're avoiding no anomalies, you end up with normally a well-structured database. So what is a well-structured relation? A well-structured relation which in the end turns into a table. It's a relation that contains minimal amount of redundancy, allows users to insert, delete, update rows without causing inconsistencies. And there are three classes of, in, of uh, inconsistencies, also known as anomalies. Um, the first one is an insertion anomaly. It's when you add a new row, and when you add that row, it forces you to create unrelated data. In other words, you have to duplicate some other data to achieve a proper insert. A deletion anomaly is the exact opposite. When you delete one piece of data, you actually take other data that goes along with it. So you end up deleting too much. A modification anomaly is when you want to change data and you have to do it in more than one place. Um, We have a table here with some data in it. I'm going to zoom in on the table just to make it easier. For okay. So here's our table of data that was up before Camtasia decided to have its moment. And in here, we have all three kinds of anomalies. So when they defined this table, they decided that the only identifier was the employee ID. Start, we'll start with an insert anomaly. The problem is that when they decide employee ID was the only primary key, we can no longer pull a unique row. So we would need to include another column or another set of data to make each row unique. And to be able to achieve that realistically, what we need to do is use the employee ID and the course title as our primary key. Fantastic. However, we just hired a new employee. Bob is coming to work for us. So we add an employee called Bob, but because we need to include a course title as part of our identifier, that means we need to add a course, but we just hired Bob. Bob is not taking any courses. Therefore, we need to create extra data just to add Bob. That's an insertion anomaly. An update anomaly would be, for example, Margaret Simpson, the first to employee ID number 100. We decided to give Margaret a raise. So Margaret's going to go from 48,000 a year to Say fifty thousand a year, big race, two thousand bucks. 
also known as $1 an hour. The problem is that we have to update her salary. We have to update it in at least two places. That means we're writing two update statements, or at least updating two rows of data. Not fantastic. Now, with today's computers, our computers are fast enough and the hard disks are fast enough. Even if we're talking about the old mechanical drives, they're fast enough that odds are nothing could go wrong. But let's think back long, long time ago when computers were not so fast. Um, some of you may wonder why Access goes away every weekend for six hours. It's because it's running on really old hardware and it needs time to think by itself. It needs to take some self-care time. So way back in the day, data wasn't stored on these, you know, relatively fast hard drives. They were stored on tape. Some of you probably remember seeing this, at least in one movie where you got the computers and the tapes are going in the background in the data center. And the data would have to, the tape would have to be moved back and forth and that would take time. So what would happen is if it updated one record and then something goes wrong and you can't update the second record, suddenly we no longer have a single source of truth. In one spot, Margaret might be making 50,000 a year and another spot she'd be making 48,000 a year. We no longer, no longer know what the truth is. Whatever that failure might be, computer crash, power outage, tape breaks. Realistically, even up till about 15, 20 years ago, there was always a risk of that happening even with the mechanical drives because mechanical drives weren't all that fast. Um, they're not fast, even by modern standards compared to an SSD or an NVMe drive or you know the even faster new interface with that, the C2 interface, whatever it is. So it's always an issue. So every time you have to do an update, it's a risk of anomalous data. And our last type, the deletion anomaly. If we suddenly decide to, um, let's get rid of Alan Beaton. So record 140 or employee ID 140. There's only one entry for Alan Beaton. Cool. But if we retire Alan Beaton or, you know, he retires or we fire him or whatever, we lose the fact that tax accounting ever existed because it's only in one place. That means when a deletion anomaly happens, when you delete one chunk of data and it takes something else along for the ride. I don't need to tell you how bad that is. When you start losing related data because of a badly structured table, it's a bad thing. So the goal of normalization is to avoid all three of these kinds of problems. We don't want to have to insert extra data. We don't want to have to update data in more than one place. And when we delete data, we don't want it to have collateral damage. So we delete specific things and we work with that. All right, so steps in normalization. For today's class and this course, we're only going to worry about the chunk on the left. Yes, same left. So we're going to worry about the first three normal forms. There's actually even more than five. There's like nine or ten normal forms. But anything past three is basically targeting specific issues. Whereas the first three cover general issues. So we'd start with a table that has multi-valued attributes and or repeating uh, collection of columns. And we want to remove those multi-valued attributes. And normally we want to try to pick out our primary key. And then we can say we're in the first normal form. We remove partial dependencies. I'll be explaining what all that is in a minute. To achieve second normal form, we remove something called transitive dependencies to get to third normal form. And then if we remove multiple candidate key issues, then we reach Boyce COD normal form. Boyce COD in the industry is also known as normal form three and a half because it lives between third and fourth. So what's between three and four? Three and a half. So Boyce COD is also known as three and a half. Um, 
And then we get rid of uh, multi-value dependencies. That's fourth. Uh, any other anomalies is fifth. And somewhere along the way, somebody needed to do some dissertations and get a PhD. So they invented a sixth and a seventh normal form. And there's actually two other named normal forms. I don't remember what they are. I've never actually used anything past voice cod. And I've been doing database stuff for 26 years. Because uh, most of the time, once you reach third normal form, there's a really good chance you're already in fourth and fifth. Okay. So we need a little bit of terminology before we can dive into the meat and potatoes of this. A functional dependency. A functional dependency is when the value of one attribute, also known as a determinant, determines the value of another attribute. These are known as candidate keys, also known as unique identifiers, which you know will become a primary key eventually, potentially. So it's a unique identifier. One of the candidate keys will become the primary key, most likely. Um, for example, there's both a credit card number and a social security number in a simple single table. Uh, in this case, both would be candidate keys. And once again, I reiterate, never ever put social security numbers and or credit card numbers in a database table unless you have no other choice. There's much better ways to store that data safely. That's just, no. Especially if your database touches the, the, the outside world in any way. It shouldn't be in there. Uh, each non-key field is functionally dependent on every candidate key. So it's saying that anything that is not a key, in other words, for you guys, we have a student number, name, email address, blah, blah, blah. Your name and your email address is dependent on your student number. The student number in this case would be the determinant, also known as a candidate key. Everything else is functionally dependent on it. So that's what a functional dependency is. All right. So I have an example I'm going to use for the rest of this discussion today. We're going to use one example to cover all of normalization. So for starters, this is not a valid relation. This is not a valid table. Can somebody tell me why it's not a valid table? And we want to take a guess. Yep, there's two IDs. But how many rows of data do we have for the two IDs? Yep, there's five rows. <laughs> what happens is over here on this side, we have what's called a repeating group of columns. And so you guys don't feel excluded, I'll highlight it on your side too. So on this side, we have what's called a repeated group, repeated group of columns. Some textbooks will call this a multi-valued set of a set of multi-valued attributes. Each attribute for a given row has more than one value. That's actually a repeating group of columns because we have entire sets of rows repeated for this one entry. So it's basically saying that the order ID currently identifies all three of these chunks of data. It's physically impossible to do that at this point in time because we don't have a complete set of data for the entire row. So how do we fix this? It's gonna blow your mind. I kid you not when I show it to you. So gonna get some terminology out of the way. Multi-valued attributes are attributes that can, that contain multiple values for a single entity instance. For example, a person has more than one phone number. A repeating group of rows is a set of two or more columns that are related to each other and can contain multiple values for a single instance. This is a repeating group of columns or repeating group of rows, depending which phrase you want to use. So how do you fix your problem? We just fill out the entire row. So now we have a complete row. I told you it was going to blow your mind. It's just a stupidly simple solution because we knew that this set of rows all belong to this order line. But since we couldn't work on the whole row of data, we just repeat the order line all the way down. So for you guys here, we just took this chunk right here and repeated it so that every row is fully complete onto itself and self-contained. Okay. The other thing we did 
is we defined the primary key. Uh, the previous slide was kind of dumb because it already had primary key defined. It shouldn't, but you know it is what it is. So we decided that the primary key is a combination of the order ID and the product ID. Based on the order ID and the product ID, we are able to find any given row in that table uniquely. So that's how you want to pick out your identifiers or your candidate key for this is we need to have a column or a combination of columns that lets us find any given row uniquely. It might be one column, could be two columns, could be three or four columns. Uh, I watched, I saw a data set up at work recently that had something like seven or eight columns to make each row unique. Because um, it's just how we receive the data. Now, the, 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 the definition of first normal form, to be completely clear, is there's no multi-valued attributes and there's no repeating groups of rows. So we eliminated those. Keep your hand up. I just want to finish the slide. Okay. And every attribute, every attribute value is atomic. In other words, each intersection of a row and a column has only a single value in it. That is what means being atomic. <clears throat> now, this figure is officially in first normal form. We have a candidate key. We have no multi-valued attributes, no repeating groups of rows. Each value is atomic. Therefore, it's a relation. Your question. Pardon? We didn't have any multi-value to start with. But so well, I can go with uh, we'll use the word skills instead of phone number. There's two values in that one cell. That's a no-no. Um, that's multi-valued. And realistically, this isn't even really that much of an issue unless it only depends on part of the primary key. If the whole thing depends on a primary key, you can get away with it, and that's what boy, uh, that's what fourth normal form is for. It's to get rid of that situation. Um, it's not a major issue at this point. Um, So it's only dependent on part of the primary key. So maybe only the employee ID would define it, but not the whole primary key. That's when it becomes an issue. And then if you break it down, there's other determinants. There's um, basically you have to go and figure out what the what's behind fourth normal form, which we're not going to cover in this class. So normally what we want to do is we want to avoid this as much as possible right off the bat, but it's not as much as a repeating group of columns. Because a repeating group of columns suddenly, or a repeating group of rows, depending which way you want to look look at the data, that's a big problem because we can't actually query it because it's missing pieces. Okay. So with our current first normal form example, we have all three kinds of anomalies are present. Anomalies are not our friend. We have an insertion anomaly. If a new product is ordered for order 1007, customer data must be re-entered causing duplication. So if I go back here and we look at 1007, if we want to add another product, we have to add another chunk of data with 1007 in it. We're duplicating data. There is an anomaly for uh, deletion. So if we delete the dining room table from order 1006, we lose information about this item's finish and price. So if I go back to order 1006 and we look at dining table, if we delete this whole row of data, we lose the fact that we ever sold a dining room table and we lose the fact that we ever had natural ash as a color. It's not great. And the update anomaly is if we change the price of product ID 4, we have to update multiple uh, records. So again, if we come over here, we look at product number 4. 
if we want to change the price of product number four, we have to do it in multiple places. It's multiple updates or a single complex update statement that has to crawl through the entire table. Both are bad. So why does this exist? Why do these anomalies exist? It's because we have multiple entity types in the same table structure, in the same relation. So remember week one lecture when I was talking about entity types? Entity types is a thing you want to model. When you try to put two entity types in the same database structure, we start having anomalies because we need to maintain both of them, but we have to do it side by side, which is not great. So now for second normal form. A partial dependency occurs when a non-key attribute depends on only part of the primary key. So that means when you have an attribute where its value is only defined by part of the primary key. So a full functional dependency means that every non-key attribute in a relation is fully functional and dependent on the primary key. I'm going to go back to my filled out little table here. Sometimes I really wish I could have like a second screen so I could keep the table up instead of having to flip back and forth. So for the partial dependencies, what we can see is the is it this one, this one, no. Oh, come on. Let's use this laser pointer. I was hoping to have it on the screen. For example, we have a customer here. These columns depend on only on this. They have nothing to do with the product ID. The description and the price and the um, and the finish only have to do with the product ID. It has nothing to do with the customer ID. Those are partial dependencies. That's saying that some of these attributes um, are only dependent on part of the primary key, so it's partially dependent. So for a table to be in second normal form, it must first be in first normal form. It's, a, it's You cannot skip a normal form. To be second normal form, you must be first normal form. Just like you can't become a super saiyan unless you're a saiyan first. It's just how it works. Every non-key attribute is fully functionally dependent on the entire primary key, so we get rid of partial dependencies. The, every non-key attribute must be defined by the entire key, not by part of the key. So we have no partial functional dependencies. Now we got ourselves on happy little chart to work with. This is the point where we stop looking at the data and we start looking at the structure of the data. Up till now, we wanted to use the data to figure out the structure. Now we need to work with the structure so we can break the data apart. And you will notice a bunch of things in here. The partial dependencies. So if we look at the order date, customer ID, customer address, it's only dependent on the order ID. It has nothing to do with the product. On the product, we have the product description, the finish, and the price only depends on the product ID and has nothing to do with it. Now, the quantity ordered is fully dependent on the entire primary key. So on this order, for this product ID, we ordered five tables. Okay. You can't define order quantity without both the product ID and the order ID. So that means it's fully dependent on the entire primary key. So it's a full functional dependency. The partial dependencies only depend on part of the primary key. There's one more on this slide that I'm skipping for the moment, which is the transitive. We'll get to that in a minute. So in the end, if we look at the dependencies, we can do it based on this kind of syntax, similar to what I had you guys doing for uh, lab one. So we have order ID determines order date, customer ID, customer name, customer address. Finds description, finish, and price, and combination order quantity. So what we do with that is we will take the partial dependencies 
and we decompose them out of the big entity. So we take the big entity, we break it down into smaller entities. That's what decompo decomposition, decom decomposition means. Mouth does not want to work today. Decomposition means, so we look at our chart we had before, find everything that was a partial dependency, and we break it out to its own table. So we end up with a order line, a product, and a customer order table. Now, once we've done that, our order line is in third normal form because every non-determinant is dependent on the entire key. So the quantity is dependent on the entire primary key. The product is also in third normal form. <coughs> we could, so every, the price, the finish, and the description depend entirely on the product ID. Therefore, it's fully dependent on itself. Not necessarily the best design, but it's fully dependent onto itself. Therefore, it's also in third normal form. And now we have the customer order. The customer order has a few issues. And it suffers from something called transitive dependencies. So now let's define what a transitive dependency is. A transitive dependency occurs when a non-key attribute is dependent on another non-key attribute. So if we go back to this chart, when we look at the bottom, piece right here, this guy. The customer address, customer name is dependent on the customer ID. The customer ID is not part of the primary key. The customer ID and the order date is dependent on the primary key. So this is known as a transitive dependency because to identify one attribute, you must transit through another tra attribute. So you're you know, you're traveling from one field to another field. Another way to know you have a transitive dependency is you say this attribute is dependent on this, which is dependent on that. The second you have dependent more than once in one entity, you have a transitive dependency. Transitive dependencies cause data redundancy, duplicate data. So if we need to update a customer's address, we'd have to do it in multiple places. We wouldn't need to touch the product anymore. We wouldn't have to worry about quantity anymore. We'd still have to worry about repeated customer records. So to be in third normal form, you must be in second normal form. That comes as a shocker. There must be no transitive dependencies anymore. So functional dependencies on non-primary key attributes are gone. So what do we do? Same thing we did with partial dependencies. We take the transitives, break them out as a separate entity. So we take that one that has the transitive dependency, just like we had in the previous um, slide. So we've got the customer information dependent on a customer ID, which is dependent on the order ID. And we would take these three things, break them out to its own table. And then, but the thing is we leave behind the identifier that was there before, because otherwise we'd lose the linkage between the data. So when we're creating our transitive, we're re resolving our transitive dependency, we take the entirety of this piece here, move it out, but leave behind a copy of the primary key. So suddenly we have our order ID, order date, and customer ID. It's in third normal form because these two columns depend entirely on that. And now we have our customer table, so we have the customer ID determines the name and the address for the customer. And that's also in third normal form because every piece is dependent on the entire key. So now if we were gonna take that and convert it into more of a diagram like you guys are used to seeing, it would look something like this. The customer is identified by customer ID, has a name and an address. The Order ID has an order ID, order date, and a customer ID. The product has a product ID, description, finish, and standard price. And over here we have the quantity. So a customer can place multiple orders. So customer ID is a foreign key. Each product and order can contain multiple products. 
Each product can only ever be in the order once because we made the product ID as part of the primary key. And this gives us some very strong advantages compared to the mess that we started with. And then we can update a customer's name or address without touching any other piece of data. We can change the price of a product in only one place. If we want to add a new product, we don't need an order. If we want to add a new customer, we also don't need an order. If we need to adjust the description of a product, we can change it here in only one place. And in the end, we have this combination here, which makes sure that we can always have a valid product for every order. And if we want to order a product, we must have a matching order. And it causes referential integrity to actually work properly. And we have a properly normalized data structure. So we went from go back all the way back from this, which turned into that, into a data structure that looks like this. Our goal is to, this has no anomalies as it stands. Okay, boys cod. I'm actually only doing the description of it. Uh, it's not going to show up on the midterm. So, let's say. So I only do one slide on boys cod. I could actually do like seven or eight slides on boys cod. Okay, so if a relation has more than one candidate key, there could still be some anomaly that result, even though that relation is in third normal form. A relation is in voice cod if and only if every determinant in a relation is a candidate key. In other words, voice cod is when every attribute or field depends on the key and nothing but the key. In other words, it never depends. We have, let's say we have multiple potential keys. To be in voice cod, we get rid of the potential multiple keys. We find a we find the right set to solve it. Sometimes we actually have to create a new attribute at this point to fix it. Now, that having been said, the goal of normalization is you work with what you're given. You don't create new things. You get to create new things when you're doing your, your logical and physical diagrams. You do normalization to give yourself structured data to work with first, but you don't create new things until you're done normalization. Then you can realize that you got this seven column compound key. It's probably not great. Therefore, you probably want to replace that with a simpler key. Um, okay. That's the end of the slideshow, not the end of normalization. Is this still recording? Excellent. All right. I'm going to do an exercise on the board covering this. And do I still have an eraser here? Yes. Uh, and of course, because of the positioning of this class, because I want to record it, I only get one whiteboard to work with on the recording. I apologize now. There'll be some erasing happening. Or there'll be something that's not going to show up on the video. It's one or the other. Uh, probably the definitions are going to go down the side that aren't going to be on the video. Okay. So I put up on screen a table of data. Let's try to make it fit the whole screen there. That's pretty good. Actually, before I start with the example, does anybody have any questions before I dive into the examples? It, the concept's strange. It's either people get it or they don't. But essentially, the goal is um, to remember why you want to normalize your data which is to avoid redundant data, which causes problems. Um, and as long as you remember the definitions and the definitions are nice and clear on the slides, um, once you do this a few times, it'll come out pretty good. This is one of the moments where I'll say chat GPT is actually pretty decent. Uh, you can ask it to create exercises for you with answers and they're actually okay. They're not great, but they're passable as an exercise.
Okay, so actually I'll be putting up the definitions as I go for during the example. So we'll see how, as I go through without the slides, how well it, it fits. Okay. Any other questions before I dive into the example? That was a three count. All right, so I've got an example of data up on the screen in my happy little Excel spreadsheet. Um, realistically, what I should have done is make it not even be in first normal form. Um, it's almost in first normal form. The only thing that's missing is uh, a primary key. So, like I said, I'm going to put the uh, definitions on the side. <clears throat> well, I do the example in the middle. Okay, the definition of 1 and F. And people at the back probably can't even read that. So the definition of first normal form is there's no repeating groups of rows, values are atomic, and the candidate key is defined. It's the definition for first normal form. So in this case, um, let me just change this to employee number like this. So when we look at our table data, we, the values are atomic. We don't have any repeating groups of columns. Like originally I could have done this. So now we have repeating groups of columns, kind of. and. We have, um, so it's atomic and we have no repeating groups. The only thing we don't have is we have not defined our primary key. Yeah. No, no, this is, this is a complete set. There's actually this example I did is, let me actually make this better. There, we'll go with this example. Okay, that's one set. That's the other set. Uh, that column I had in there, I had that left over for when I was doing voice COD with another group of students. <laughs> this is not a repeating group right now because each, um, each of these, there's a way to uniquely identify each row. So there's no repeating group because our primary key is actually those three columns. We can identify any given chunk of data based on those three columns. The bad thing about this example, and I'll put it up front now, there's no transitive dependencies in it. I'll still put up the definition for it in a bit, but there's no transitive dependencies, um, which is unfortunate. Okay. So that having been said, we have identified our candidate key. It's a compound key of three columns. Therefore, we are technically now in first normal form. So when I write it out, we got 1NF, and we can go with uh, Uh, 
I'm going to shorten some of these field names so I don't have to uh, write an insane amount. Name. Project. Number. Project. Description. Project. Task. Hours. Okay. We've identified our primary key as being orange. I'm putting it orange, actually, I should say, as these three columns. Okay, right, that's our Canada key. I'll be reusing these same colors over and over and over again. So now we have a full dependency of, okay, that marker is not doing a good job. Let's try this one. That's got to be the squeakiest whiteboard I've ever seen. Okay. This is a full dependency. Then C. Thank you. These are partial dependencies. So we've identified our stuff in being in first normal form. We don't have any transitive dependencies. Um, I'll be doing another example of that probably next week. Okay, so now we need to um, go to second normal form. And I'm gonna put a uh, definition over here. Actually, I'll put it over here. Definitions on board. So candidate key, potentially it's a potential primary key. It's our identifier. A full dependency is the attribute is fully dependent on the candidate key. A partial dependency means the attribute depends on part of the candidate key, but not the entire candidate key. So to go into second normal form, must 
B in more form. No partial dependencies. All right, so to be in second normal form, you must be in first normal form, which we are. And there can be no partial dependencies. So we want to get rid of the partial dependencies. So at this point, we're going to give our uh, entities names. We have employee. which has employee number, employee name, employee email, and we know That's fully dependent on it, so we're happy. We are going to have a project. Which has a project number. Project description. And we have time entry, which has employee number, project number, project task hours. So we know this is all fully dependent on the entire primary key. I am going to throw on one last color for everybody's enjoyment. Throwing on some purple, which of course people at the back can't see because the monitor is probably in the way. in this case is the foreign key. Um, now, that having been said, I need to put down the last definition for 3 and F, which is must be in 2 and F. No transitive dependencies like that. That's me in third normal form. So the bad news about this example is it didn't have transitives. 
So what happened is we went straight from first normal form straight into third. We skipped, we did two and two became three because we didn't have any transitives. So technically this is both two NF and three NF. Um, because in this case, there's no partial, there's no transitives. But I'm still going to put the definition for transitive on the board over there so you guys have it. And uh, I will come next week with a better example ready for everybody. Because you know what? This will percolate for a week. And then I'll tackle this on right at the start of the next class, like another example. And people are going to be like, uh, right. <laughs> Literally, that's what that sounds going to happen. So I'm going to put on uh, the definition. Never seen such a squeaky whiteboard. Okay. Oops. I gotta stay consistent. So transitive dependency is an attribute that is defined or identified by a non-key attribute. Okay, that's the definitions. I am going to dig out my phone, take some pictures of the board, so I can post these for you guys. And if anybody wants to run up here before, you know, once I wrap up, and you want to take your own pictures, because who knows? How my pictures are going to turn out. I don't want to record. There we go. If you want to take, yeah, go ahead and take pictures. I'll just get out of the way. Just don't want to cross in front of the camera because then I have to cut that out. Those three board, I'm going to post mine. Uh, but, you know, I never guarantee that my phone will survive the trip home. Therefore, you know, this is your chance to take pictures. All right, hang on. I only caught half of what you just said. The acoustics in this room are terrible. Okay, what was that? The non-atomic values. So we have uh, the common delimited list, for example. Um, those would actually become another table. So that's what the fourth normal form is about, is to get rid of multi-valued. What you're talking about, the non-atomic is a, a multi-valued attribute. When you have a multi-valued attribute that is dependent on the on just the key, you then break those out into a separate entity of their own. So you take it and break it out. No, usually not. Um, that's the big problem with first the definition of first normal form is depending what textbook you read. They'll use repeating group of columns, repeating group of rows, or multi-valued attributes interchangeably. Um, no, re I really, I wish I was kidding. Uh, the other database course that I regularly teach, we've been through four textbooks in the last 16 years. And out of those four textbooks, I've seen all three descriptions for first normal form. 
it seems that essentially the goal is that in the end you want no repeating groups of columns or rows. Cool. And you want to avoid multi-valued attributes whenever possible. In theory, you could leave them behind and deal with them later if they're atomic, as in the values in that cell can still be identified by the entire primary key. You can't identify each individual value, but, you know. Um, we could, in theory, deal with it after third normal form. Uh, maybe I'll make sure I have an example of that for next week so we can attack it. Um, all right. Any questions about the pain and suffering I inflicted on your brains today? Definitions aren't complicated. They're actually pretty straightforward, but sometimes the implications are not straightforward. Um, this will be the most point form version of normalization on the board you'll ever see. That's why I'm, I suggest people take those pictures because they're a really good reference for that. All right. Going once, going twice. Three times. Okay. So what's next? Uh, there's a lab for normalization. It's up to you if you want to start it this week. We're already a week ahead for the labs as it is. If you want to wait a week until I do the example next week, a second example next week for you guys, then probably make more sense. The other example I'll have will be, we'll have a transitive dependency and I might throw in a multi-valued just to cover his use case. Um, but yeah, I won't be putting up all the definitions the next time. I'll just be going through the example. And if there are no questions, that's the topic for this week. Um, like I said, give it a week to percolate, form up some questions. And at the start of next week, before I dive into next week's topic, we can tackle, you know, spend half an hour tackling normalization again. Oh, there's a hand over here. Yay. Yep. In MySQL Workbench and a, some other diagramming tool for the conceptual diagram. You can just upload two PNGs, well, four PNGs. Or you can take the PNGs and put them in Word and then upload Word. You either upload four individual files, you upload it as a Word document, I don't really care. When you do it as actual images, it's easier for me to work with because then I can zoom in on each image. When it's Word, Brightspace looks kind of weird because uh, Brightspace actually renders the Word document for me. So I don't even need to download it. Yeah. Diagrams or images? ERD plus? Absolutely. Um, I actually deleted the line in the lab that says how to do it in Visio. Anybody want to take a guess why I took that away? With the version of Visio we get here at the college, we can no longer create ERD diagrams without a premium license. It used to be that everybody got a downloadable version of Visio which had, which had every template type in it. Now we get Visio for dummies, which lets you create flow diagrams, flow charts, organizational diagrams, but you can't create ERDs, you can't create UML diagrams, you can't create any of the programming ones unless you have a premium license. And apparently, college doesn't want to pay for it. So I took the instructions away. Yeah, hang on. Let me just stop the recording and then you can come up. So in here, what you identify your candidate key at the beginning by finding the combination of columns that allows you to uniquely identify every row. So we go, okay, what combination of columns lets me find any given row? In this, it's a combination of the task, the project number, and the employee number. Employee number alone is not enough to find the entire row. Project number, not the entire row. Task, not the entire row. Combination of employee and project number also doesn't do the entire row. Technically, possibly we could get away with the project task. But what happens if the person has a third row with 
you know, the same task, but a different project. Therefore, the only way to uniquely identify the entire row is a combination of the employee, the project number, and the task. Right. One, two, three, 